This episode of the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast is brought to you by Sacrete. With Sacrete Fast Setting Concrete, you're setting posts in 30 minutes without mixing. Hanging fence stringers the same day, not the next. Pouring slabs that are ready for traffic in six hours, not 24 hours. Getting in, getting out, getting on to the next job while the other guy is waiting for his mix to set. It's the concrete upgrade that pays for itself. Faster set, less prep, more jobs, more revenue, easy choice. See the proof at sacretefast.com. Getting the job done right is the goal of every home builder and homeowner. As a member of our building community, All Access will become a trusted resource for every stage of your building and renovation projects. Plus, we're constantly adding new project guides, videos, articles, expert tips, and more for members only, because there's always more work to be done. Sign up now or give a gift to another builder at findhomebuilding.com slash allaccess. That is a tricky question because I really have done so well and been so lucky doing a business that focuses on what the customer needs. What's good for the electrical business, I think, is doing a better job for them. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by electrician David Shapiro. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. David, thanks very much for being on the show. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be joining you. I introduced you as an electrician, but you are so much more. You do teaching and consulting work. You've uh, written. You've been in. uh, Can you please tell me about your work history and how you got to be an electrician? Well, I can sum up my work history in one adjective. It's been fun. (laughs) I am so lucky that. I have the zest for what I do and what I've done, that I'm able to help people be safer, been able to reach out to tens of thousands of other electricians, help them help their customers, that I've been able to learn and teach, which can be just a blast. Oh, that's why we do it that way. Oh, boy, I'd better not fake it on that one. You're it, talking it, from the voice of your uh, student, right? You're saying, oh, now, now, now I see why that matters, right? My student starting with this student. <laughs> Good. <laughs> How long have you been I an electrician? Pay it forward. There's so many people I've learned from. Okay. So it's my turn to do more of helping others. How long have you been an electrician, and, and how did you get there? Well, I started in about 72. I've been a master electrician since 1980 or 81. Uh, my dad was an electrician, then a shop teacher. He's the one who started me using tools. And he, uh, I got in the union. I left the union, which... In some ways, it was a mistake. I worked for other people. And then the other primary influence on me, besides Lou Shapiro, my dad, on one of the first jobs where I pulled the permit, the inspector came there. He said, this here, this is a violation. And it was something simple. I, I'd left out a few staples, I think, something like that. And I say, Hey, look, I, I have them right here. If I just pop them in, will you, will you pass the job? And I said, yeah, sure, do it. Only a, a minute, hey, it's, it's fast, am I coming back? And he said, you know, you might benefit if you go to some of these meetings and you get continuing education every month or two. And there's this group, the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, which is not just inspectors, and they teach these classes. And I went, and I've been going for 
over 35 years and eventually volunteering, teaching for them, writing for them. And that I wish I knew that man's name because he wasn't just, ah, gotcha. He was, yeah, this little thing, straightening it out good and meanwhile become a better electrician. And mm, yeah, I love that. <laughs> So I got to ask you briefly, how did your dad become an electrician? Can I guess that was probably uh, the early days of uh, wiring when he started? Am I right about that? No, I, I'm, I'm not quite that ancient. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was World War II in a, a Navy shipyard, and it was uh, shipboard wiring. And then he came back from the war and uh, became an electrician uh, in residential work, commercial work, both. Yep, yep. yep. That's what I did in the union, though. What I've done in my own business has been almost exclusively residential. And the column I wrote for 20 plus years was on residential wiring. Some of the other stuff is not just residential. But that was the article I sold to find home building that ended up in the best of fine home building was also basically oriented towards residential. That that's been my forte. So how was your training in the, uh, in the union, David, did they do a good job of training young electricians to be good ones? They do a wonderful job. They did then. And I have no reason to believe they do otherwise now because I know some of the people involved in that training. And I learned skills that were really good. I don't know if my attitude towards workmanship came from them was earlier, but it was, it was a very valuable training. Some people learn by just doing a quasi-apprenticeship in the military. Mm -hmm. I knew somebody who was a wireman in a submarine, and once he finished this hitch, he could have come back to civilian life and started out pretty much as a journeyman and was be pretty close to becoming a master. Mm. Uh, some people do trade school. Yeah. You know, I've always told young people who are interested in trade work, get, get paid to learn. And, you know, the union and the military seems like a good way to do that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's what works for you that I know people teaching non-union who, you know, same apprenticeship that take it seriously. I respect that. If you're helping young people, whichever way you're doing it. Uh, I know people who for whom it's a second career. Uh, one friend, Susan Flashman, uh, was a political scientist, moved on to that. I have a, a friend, a, a customer, Ed, who, a physicist. I would love to have him join me as a, a, as a as a journeyman. Frankly, is a, a fine woodworker and furniture maker, and his care is exquisite. And that's what you want because this stuff can be deadly. Yeah, it's the stakes are high. Uh, on the subject, I've seen some pretty dodgy electrical work in the years I've spent remodeling uh, crappy old houses. Is is that people cutting corners, or do they not understand the code and best practice, or does it even matter? Is this an academic discussion, or is this a legitimate question? Oh, it is a key question, Patrick, because if somebody is in there to look good enough to get paid and get out of there, I don't see much we can do for them. If somebody doesn't realize the four things you need, they can be helped, if, if, if you will. There's, there's hope. There's no reason not to do a better job, a more careful job, a more appropriate job, a safer one. They need to learn the manual skills. They need to learn to inspect their work, to test it, to check it for more than just, is it working at the moment? They need to know the installation code and not just code, codes. Because if you know the electrical code and you don't know the IRC, for instance, 
you can put the building in violation. If you know the plumbing code and don't know the electrical code, you can create, or, or the sheet, sheet metal workers, if you're an HVAC expert and don't know enough about the electrical code, you can put the electrical work in violation like that. Hmm. And I've seen it again and again and again. And last, you need to know the product standards enough to recognize this doesn't belong here. You shouldn't be using this. It's not the right thing. Or to know, hey, this stuff that the guy in the hardware store has, all right, I'm not going with inventory engineering. No, this isn't what I need here. And I can give you examples of each of these if we got time as we proceed. Well, so like, uh, you know, what do you see oftentimes is done incorrectly that drives you crazy? Well, people learn that the electrician puts wires together, twists this plastic thing over them. That's what splicing looks like from the outside. But unless somebody has taught you to splice, you don't know how to strip the insulation off well. You don't know how to get the right length. You don't know how to put the wires together well. And after you twist it on, you don't know what the right size is to use even. You may, you may mistake that. And you don't know enough to hold that wire nut and tug on each of those wires to make sure it's held properly. And I've seen there's a, a carpenter replaced a light fixture. I mean, he just dropped it and put it back up so he could paint around it without having to tape it. And the whole floor of the building went out because... It, he didn't know to test the splices. He didn't know how to make the splice. He'd seen somebody do them, but it was an emergency call for me. Not just get an electrician sometime, but no receptacles, no lights anywhere on the floor. And what a bloody <laughs> shame. Yeah. But well, that's not somebody replacing a light. And do you remember what I asked you about lights? Yeah, to... to how would you, I know what the temperature rating of the conductors were, right? Yeah, good man. Because that's critical. Most light fixtures you buy nowadays, customer says, can you put this up for me? The electrician isn't going to be here for a week. Can you? Yeah, I splice. And you can splice and you can secure the thing. But if you don't know, it says in this little tag tucked under the fiberglass over here, it says, suitable for 90 degrees C rated wiring. And you can't tell that these wires in the ceiling, which have no marking on them, are pre-1970 or pre-mid 80s even. You could start a fire. Maybe not today, maybe two years from now. And you don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. What's frightening to me about bad electrical work, and I think you'd agree, is it often still works. It's not enough to attract attention, unlike a broken pipe, for example. If it's pouring water or sewage on the floor, people are going to do something about it. But you could live for decades with uh, dangerous wiring. Am I right? You are absolutely right, Patrick. And I will extend that. I went on a job one time where they used armored cable, which is my favorite wiring method when it's installed right, because you put a nail through it, it will trip the breaker. Nothing else is that guaranteed. Uh, well, yeah, nothing else really. Uh, and somebody had installed windows above it, and they did a nice job. No air came through, but somehow... In installing them, there was some lack. Water was getting into the wall slowly. It took probably decades. <laughs> Finally, the armor was dust. So there was no ground on that circuit. So, no, it's not just electrical, but you're quite right. It can be subtle. It can kick you. It can bite you. Yeah. <laughs> We get uh, asked a lot about knob and tube wiring, as you might imagine, uh, both in for FHB magazine questions and the podcast. Uh, 
It's very expensive and difficult to rewire an entire old house, so people are naturally hesitant to remove it. What are your thoughts on knob and tube wiring? I've heard two different things. I've heard you should remove it all and run away, and I've also heard it can be safe um, if it's left the way it was. Is, is that still true? Because by this point, this stuff is really old now. Okay, this takes a little subtlety. Number one, if it was installed properly, the wires are some distance apart. And air is a perfectly good insulator. But it was a fine old system when it was installed legally initially, except for one thing. At that time, we didn't ground. And there's no ground wire there. And at one point, they used to ground to the nearest cold water pipe. And by golly, plumbers went from using metal to PC in that rotted out pipe, that pinhole pipe, piece of pipe or tubing with PVC, with, with various other plastics. And now you had energized plumbing. If there was a short on that circuit, it wouldn't trip the breaker because it didn't have a path back until you touched it which case it still wouldn't trip the breaker because it's going across your body, your heart, and your lungs. So that could be very deadly. Now, the other thing is people sometimes wouldn't run that ground wire to the nearest cold water pipe, which was legal, or nowadays to the grounding electrode system or the panel, which is legal. But if you're going to run it all the way back there, you might as well run a new cable, damn it. So that, that's where you get that one answer. Sometimes they would bootleg. In other words, they, they want to put in a three-prong receptacle. They take that ground prong and run a little wire from it to the neutral. And so you had energized grounded circuits. And we should point out that that'll fool one of those little testers you plug in the receptacle, right? It'll look like it's grounded, but it's not really. There's no equipment ground. Those testers are excellent for telling you if something's wrong. They won't tell you if it's right because they can be fooled in different ways. The other thing is that I have a friend in, in Ohio, a, 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 a protege, if you will, who works with a lot of knob and tube. And what he tells me in a lot of places they have knob and tube that never, ever was legal from my look at the code. And I have the code back to 1915 or so. And never. And what it is, it, are you familiar with a multi-wire circuit? No. Okay. I, I mean, I think you're sharing a neutral, right? You're Exactly. Only with some knob and tube, they'll share a neutral with five fuses, seven fuses. <laughs> So, hey, it's, as long as they don't pour insulation there, which is pretty deadly for knob and tube wiring, uh, as long as they, they don't pour insulation or pack insulation or blow insulation in there, that that overheated wire, hey, it doesn't matter if the insulation flakes off, it's not going to melt, not not even if it's pulling 50 amps, probably. may make things brittle at each end. So... I, I'm with the people who say it may be okay, but there are big problems with it. What about uh, BX or aluminum cable or aluminum conductor cable, I should say? Okay. Aluminum conductor cable, I'm not going to talk about except to say you got to get it right. You That's really been deadly and... There's a book that just came out some months ago from an expert who researched it, and I'd recommend people curious about that get themselves a copy of Hot Connections. I have my copy. I'm here. writing this down, David. <laughs> yeah. Is this someone you know? Yeah, it's somebody I highly respect, a researcher who is worked on wire nuts, on aluminum wiring. That's on fascinating. Breakers. <laughs> yeah, just came out a few months ago. And if you can read backwards, you got it there. But on BX, again, 
it is so easy for people to misunderstand it, to misname it. There are two types of cables that have metal coverings. There's metal clad type MC, and there's armored cable AC, or also known as BX. Sometimes people misuse the language. But the problem with MC is that the sheath is not a ground. Within a few feet of a connector, it's bonded, so it may trip a breaker if you penetrate it. But if it's a 50-foot length, anybody knows. Uh, the advantage is it has a wire ground in the most common type of MC. The big advantage of AC, of armored cable, is that you put a screw or a nail through that anywhere along the way. And I've done this. I'm <laughs> sad to say. <laughs> uh, just like I bent this finger here, <laughs> I, 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 I've put a screw through through BX. But if it's modern BX, the type with a thin aluminum bonding strip in it, it is a ground and you make the connections to each end correctly. And I... You are good. But if you think, oh, that aluminum wire, that that must be the ground, so I'm going to splice it. And I've seen home inspectors recommend this. Or if you think, oh, it goes in the connect, let's use a Romex connector, it should be, then you've done some deadly stuff. Mm -hmm. And the old BX, back before they added that thin strip in there, that was like MC. You could not rely on the armor. But modern BX, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I'm working with a customer, and over the years I've just delighted in teaching customers in a sweat equity work with situation, that's what we install. Because even though I'm going to have my eyeball on every inch of it to make sure it was done right, there's so much lower chance that it's going to be damaged by pushing and pulling as long as they don't bend it tight. Interesting. So it's, it's the, it's tougher. It's, it's tougher for them to damage it running it. If you're using full thickness, steel armored BX, yeah. I, I've seen people make all kinds of, yeah, but, but that's what I'm talking about. And what about these we, uh, old versions of uh, non-metallic sheath cable? With like, often I've seen them with like kind of a cloth covering, or it looks like you know it's wrapped yeah. with yeah. threads, maybe bitumen. Yeah, bituminized. Uh, yeah, it is old. Most of that has rag wiring, has rubber and cloth covered conductors inside it, and. In, what was it? At least in my second book, this one. <laughs> right? We should tell folks, you're holding up a copy of Your Old Wiring, which is a fantastic title uh, that you wrote. Cool. Right. Uh, in that, and I think even in the serious one, the, this is for people who know something. I talk about- Is this yours too? What? Yeah, is that one your two? Old electrical wiring. That was my first book. This is a second edition. All uh, right. The Moore Hill book from about a decade or two ago. I got uh, I got a but, ton of reading now because of you. <laughs> yeah, but I talk about how to test it. How do you test rubber covered wiring to see if it's in good shape? But for a lot of cases, a lot of cases, hey. It's 75 years old. It's 100 years old. It's rubber. <laughs> if you had 75-year-old galoshes. Right. Or a tire, right? You would never drive on an 80-year-old tire, you know? Yeah, you, you got it exactly. And it's probably been subjected to heat. Heating and cooling from the, the insulation uh, is protecting the wires which electricity is running through. I've seen some pretty crispy wiring in old attics, especially. It's, it seems to do a number on it up there. Basement, se it seems to fare a little better, assuming it's reasonably dry. We keep exactly. hearing about a switch to uh, a renewable energy grid and how home and vehicle uh, will help store those electrons uh, for the evening. 
My guess is that our homes are not ready for this type of switch. Uh, do you think that's true? Uh, I'm going to go somewhere where you may not have been anticipating. Go for it. <laughs> I, I've been involved in a lot of volunteer work over the years. One of the things I've done is I've worked as the recording secretary for most of the meetings of the American Council for Electrical Safety. And the people involved in that are mostly testing labs and some government agencies. Like UNL. <laughs> Yeah, like UL, like ETL, like QPS, like CSA, there there are about sixteen of them. Uh, CE is not a U.S. testing agency. CE mark or an ROHS mark doesn't mean squat in terms of whether it meets our standards. It it may also meet our standards, but that by itself doesn't. But all these folks and the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Department of Labor or OSHA. These people are all involved in there. And one thing I learned is that most computer systems are hacked, are vulnerable. And so when you're going to go with a smart system where my home has this thing, which is communicating with the cloud to control my lights, to control my furnace, to control my everything, I get bloody nervous. <laughs> Right, because yeah. there are people out there who will totally exploit that for their own advantage, uh, politically uh, to capitalize to ransoms, right? We've seen that happen. We still see it happen. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do it to a hospital right, and kill people, because the data say people have died as a result of these, these ransomware attacks in hospitals, how would you not do it to a home? So there's that, there's the fact that you're going to need, in any backup system, you're going to need to have transfer switch. You may need to have a sub-panel that it feeds to. You may need load controller. You need enough service capacity for fast charging if you want that. It's no more than an electric stove or maybe even an electric dryer, but you, mm. you need that. And you bloody well better make sure that you're not going to backfeed into the grid when power is down, because you can kill somebody that way. And if you're using it as... Do you need to get that? I'm just not. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to plug it. <laughs> I thought, I, I won't need to unplug it. Within half an hour, an hour, never happened. Your warranty's about to expire, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, the, other, the other thing is, if you're going to use, if you have a hybrid vehicle and it's plug-in, mm, you have a, a generator. Yeah. But like any other generator, you don't want to kill somebody on a pole trying to repair power. You don't want to use it in the house or near an air intake or a window so you don't kill yourself with carbon monoxide. Mm. You got to keep these things in mind. Mm. What do you think uh, we should be? So the electrical code I know recently required, uh, you know, a 110 outlet in the garage. I think it was 20 amps for like plug-in hybrids and stuff. And I'm sure you'd agree that's not enough for an electric car. Do you think the code is going to start requiring at least the cables to be run for, you know, charging stations? No. No, it, it, maybe in 10 years, if we've really reached a tipping point, and that, that's a big deal, yeah. I mean, the code is requiring so many new things that are real safety issues. 2020 code now requires that you have surge protection in your home, you, you, at your panel or ahead of your panel. You think that's a good idea or is that overreaching? That is a, another of those Funny questions you have, Patrick. <laughs> Very funny. And I'll tell you why. It's because I just researched how we got that rule. And we got that rule because they've been trying since 
For over a decade, they've been trying to urge we put in surge protection. And every time the code council said, good idea, but optional. If you want to protect yourself, it's not life safety. And people would say, but if you get a surge, if there's lightning a few blocks away, you can destroy your GFCIs, you can destroy your AFCIs, you can destroy your smoke alarms. They said, no, no, no. So in the 2017 code, they had a proposal saying, look, we have documentation that facilities managers, industrial sites have problems, and this and this and this has happened as a result. of And some people have gotten hurt too, though it's mostly equipment. Mm-hmm. And so they said, no, 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 it's optional. But for the 2020 code, they referred to that same documentation to say, Let's put it at least in homes. So <laughs> it's not it's not expensive as I as I it's like maybe a hundred bucks. Is that correct? Uh, let's say a hundred, hundred fifty depends on what you want to do. These have metal oxide varistors, little jobbies inside them that's short to ground. You short one to ground, it may be dead. There's another. So how big it is tells you how many of them they're going to be in there. How long is it going to last till the lights go out? And hopefully you notice that those lights are no longer on. They say, this is a a lump. It's not a surge protector anymore. (laughs) It's interesting. You know, to me, it makes a lot of sense to, uh, it makes this economy make sense to me that you want to save these devices in in the event of an electrical strike. Uh, it, It seems reasonable to me, but... You know, I can see where builders don't want to pay for this. It's something that the customer doesn't really understand and is not going to ask for, right, in most instances. So it's, it's a, they're difficult questions. I think you'd agree. I, I, I'm with you. I have a friend in West Virginia who had a lightning strike the next property over, maybe, or two. And he had to replace the board of his dishwasher. Mm. And, and so he's, he's sold. By that experience, yeah, yeah, right. I keep hearing of about shortages of trade workers in most fields. Is that also true of electricians? Oh yeah, and yeah. and in and competent inspectors, uh, but that's also a matter of budget. Are you willing to pay? Am I willing to pay enough taxes to have a building department that will hire? a master electrician to be the chief electrical inspector or do without a chief electrical inspector altogether and have nobody telling the jurisdictional inspectors, Hey, you need this training. I, I need to give you this class. So you know what you're doing. And unfortunately there are a lot of jurisdictions where they're shy. They're missing. Uh, they take that, 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 that little test, they plug it in. That's about it. Or they say, we are two rounds. Uh, no, your water pipe, that's a ground. I never heard about that. No, I want two rods. Here's it in the coat. No, no, I want two rods. Well, <laughs> if people don't know any trade and they inspect it, they run it, they, they supervise what you do. If they don't know what they're doing, they lose respect. And we need inspection. We need qualified inspection because I miss things. And I've been doing this, you know, s- since <laughs> since whenever. And the, and the rules change, right? Uh, the way you did uh, things five years ago might be different than how you should do them now, right? The rules <laughs> change. The rules <laughs> change. Oh, God, do the rules change. I mean, what, what do you do? I, I could give you 10 changes. Okay. In in this book, I think it is, in your old wiring, I talk about despard switching. Despard switching was where you used two wires between two switches, either of which would control light. It was dangerous. Mm. It worked. In the last few years, 
we've added a new rule. So not only can't you put in desk part switching anymore, you need a three wire cable between those two switches, but you usually need a four wire cable. And that's because they're changing technology because the products have changed. You need yeah. a neutral now when you didn't necessarily in the past, right? For switches. You, you need, if you want an illuminated switch, yeah. you can't just dribble that little bit of power to ground because it'll trip a GFCI somewhere. <laughs> so you need a neutral. And this is new. Uh, if you want to put a, a, a box in the ceiling for a light, in most places, it's going to be rated fan support. This is new. If you didn't keep up on this, you will put in something that's illegal mm -hmm. with no intention to cheat the customer, do something bad or wrong. Yeah. And how how do electricians uh, keep up with the rules? Do good electricians buy the new rule book every cycle and read it? I mean, can you can you discern what's different by just reading through it? I bet some people could, but that's probably rare. You absolutely can because it's marked each place it's changed in the book. But you also have requirements in most areas of the country for electricians and in at least some for inspectors. Should be all of them, my opinion. But requirements that you take continuing education. And you know, somebody says, hey, watch out, yeah, this, this happens. And there's magazines, there's all kinds of ways we learn. Because if we don't, you're right, we're behind, we miss it, we can do things that are wrong. Somebody can get hurt, a house can burn down, they can say, how did you do that? <laughs> oh, maybe it was installed in the 1980s. No, 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 wait a minute. It wasn't. And, yeah. Um, one thing I've observed in the 30 plus years I've been around residential construction is that new houses have tons more electrical stuff in them. Uh, can lights in the ceiling, uh, more comfort equipment, uh, gadgets. When I was a teen, a like 200 amp panel would have been considered pretty big in most houses. Now I routinely see houses with several 200 amp panels. Uh, what the heck is going on? I mean, I'm sure it's good for the electrical business, but do we need all this stuff? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that is a tricky question because I really have done so well and been so lucky doing a business that focuses on what the customer needs. What's good for the electrical business, I think, is doing a better job for them. Is, hey, if if you have a home which has older wiring, let's put in some arc fort circuit interrupters or ground fort interrupters where there weren't to make sure that if things go, they don't take you with them. Mm -hmm. So that if there's, there's a glowing connection that will never trip a breaker but can start a fire, it may just start to arc and then it'll trip that GFCI, that AFCI. Or, okay, I'll go ahead and put in a surge arrestor for you because hey, if there's some utility surge, some light, that's what does it. Because I can put in two toner damp panels, but I have to supply a class of service application to the utility. And that says, here are the loads. And if they say, these loads would be served fine with 60 amp service. That's what the transformer and that's what the drop coming from the pole is going to be able to carry. I didn't know that, that they had uh, the potential to, you know, call BS on this. That's interesting. It's always been true. Huh. And yeah, the, the other thing is, I've known people whose panels filled up. We just filled up a, a panel for uh, one of my customers, but you put in a sub panel. Yeah. They, they don't, they're not using 200 amps. They just have more than 20 or 30 circuits, right? Yeah. Uh, or, and you can now buy 66 space panel boards, 200 amps. You got how, how long is that, David? That sounds like that'd be like five foot tall. <laughs> 
<laughs> some of them are kind of big, and some of them are made better, and some not so well. Even in some good brands, but you're you're, you're right. But they're, they're not ridiculous size. Can I ask you to name names? Who who makes the the good stuff, and is it worth paying for? I would say that's tricky because I've seen good and bad from many brands, but I would say this, that the Schneider Squirty QO panels that do not have a plug on neutral have a wonderful reputation. The Eaton Cutler Hammer at least used to have a, a very good reputation. Uh, there are others. The, more important, there are some that if you're in a somewhat older home and you have this, get an electrician to yank it out because they've been proved deadly. So and what's that product? Uh, the Federal Pacific Stab Lock. That uh, I, I, Jesse Aronstein also researched that, did a lot of research on it. Uh, and they they hoodwink underwriters' laboratories. They, they, they didn't, they would not have passed the testing when they came out to visit the factories, but they tricked them. That's awful. And, Has there been any culpability uh, associated with this? Have they had class action suits? This goes back to a, there have been suits and they've been won by the plaintiffs or settled favorably. And Aaron Steen is one of the people who's, who's uh, testified in them. But my understanding of what happened is that the issue with Federal Pacific and the fraud, as, as I understand, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I use words the way I think of things. <laughs> right, the way uh, normal people talk about stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that came up just after the Consumer Product Safety Commission went down in flames fighting the aluminum wiring. And just didn't have the bucks to to beat out the 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 uh, manufacturers. I've been pretty happy with my uh, home line um, panels. Yeah. Uh, they're less expensive Square D panels sold at the yeah. box store. Um, have you heard of any problems with the lesser tier stuff from the big makers? I. Have not any chapter and verse on that. I would not be shy about installing Homeline or installing um, Eaton BR. Uh, and, and they're not the only two brands that are have a good reputation. They're just the two that I have a fair amount of experience with mm -hmm. that have a good reputation. Uh, in fact, there was a reason I recommended the second tier line for a customer because there's a difference in the design of the circuit breakers between the two at the time. So no, I, I wouldn't say, oh, big problem, but there, there are brands. And if you go to the Inspectopedia website, it's a, a former technical uh, expert for the American Society of Home Inspectors runs this. He's got chapter and verse on the tests and on the problems and on the brands mm. at Inspectopedia. That's that's hugely helpful. It so is. Uh, this is uh, my favorite part of the show. Uh, can you please tell me about your own house? What is it like architecturally? How long have you lived there? Does it have good wiring? It's split ranch. It has excellent wiring, and I'll tell you why. We've, we've owned it about seven years. We've lived here about five years. Uh, when I bought it, I was going to replace the. It was ready to move in. 
top home inspector looked at it for me and spent extra time because we're colleagues. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of home inspectors send customers to me. They say something about this wiring, have Dave look at it. Uh, and this gentleman was uh, the, the president of ASHI at one point. He was really careful. So I was prepared to replace receptacles with tamper-resistant receptacles, which, again, are now required in residences and lots and lots of other places. And if last time you say wiring was 20 years ago, well, you could screw up if you didn't know about this. And I got to one receptacle, threw off the breaker. You, you do that unless you're, you know, being a little sloppy about things or or cocky. Uh, I was 20 amp breaker, pulled out the receptacle, this 14 gauge wiring on it, which was 15 amp. I said, I don't know where they did the connection. I don't know what else they did. We gutted the house. <laughs> gutted. We should tell folks who are maybe less familiar with wiring. When you pulled out this receptacle, what was supposed to be a 20 amp circuit had wiring for a 15 amp circuit. And of course, you were then immediately uh, suspicious of the rest of the wiring in the house because you don't know what happened. There's that. There's the fact that even though it probably would be fine. I'd probably never pull more than it could handle. My big fear is what kind of connecting did he do at the other end when he joined into the... the <laughs> or practice. worse, in the middle, like in a stud cavity, right? I'm sure you've Ooh. seen that with no box. It's just there. I see that in kitchens and bathrooms, which get remodeled pretty often. Uh, You're kidding, Patrick. People do that. <laughs> it's horrible, right? <laughs> I'd yeah, say it, it should be illegal, but it is illegal. <laughs> and burn out a house. They yeah. don't know any better. There's it, it, no malice involved. Yeah. But my, me fires. My neighbor called me to her house when the bath fan wasn't working. So I turned off the circuit and opened up the junction box and the fan, and I found that the poorly made wire nutted connection uh, had... Uh, was arcing enough to melt the uh, fine stranded conductors on the uh, bath fans motor. And that's why the fan no longer worked. Fortunately, it was in junction box. So it didn't cause any real damage, but it didn't short out oddly. Yeah. <laughs> Look, Patrick, you, you've said the magic word, bath exhaust fan. There's one, if, if I may, there's one thing I'd like to advise you re- your readers and listeners about bath exhaust fans. The oil standard just changed May a year ago, and I don't know if the change was good enough. But the problem is this. They are permitted, and there's been an attempt to override this and change the standard, but that went down. There were not enough votes for it. They are permitted to be made of pretty flammable plastic. Mm-hmm. from the impellers, the housings, whatever. And in terms of home maintenance, one thing you should do besides cleaning out, if you have a dryer, it's exhaust stock, clean it out every year or two of the lint. Any fan, you should pop that grill and make sure it's not crudded up. Just over time with you know, somebody shaved, somebody toweled themselves and there's a hit bander went up in there because if it jams it reaches end of life is locked rotor condition it overheats and it can melt them start a fire so that's one thing about the other thing is if you possibly can replace the switch controlling them with the timer because we say that's a good idea for many reasons right home and left the fan on. There have been fires at night when they were in bed and babies have died. This is not gee, a good idea. This is real stuff. Huh. So uh, why are they allowed to make this out of these materials? That seems like that's an easy thing to fix. 12 cents savings per unit. That's unconscionable. There's a program on 2020 uh, where, where they interviewed on that. Well... You know, sometimes changes are made after, like, uh, national media uh, makes a stink, right? So we, we might see something on that front. 
It it hasn't. The proposal came in after that. Again, this is not my expertise. This is yep. what people who are experts have told me. But what? my plan's on timer. That way I leave the house, I go to bed, it's going to go off unless that fails and the timer fails. I got to add this to my to-do list now, David. Timer fan, okay. Um, so what are you, uh, any upgrades, uh, electrical or otherwise, planned for the house, your house? I may, we have, we really indulge ourselves. We have a library. Nice. Instead of a living room. <laughs> but I have receptacles at the at the base of the bookcases, and they are controlled by the uh, light switch, and uh, I may change that around. The other thing is I may, uh, I may put a uh, receptacle and light at the base of our driveway so that I'm backing my truck up. A uh, sensor says, let's light the driveway so I mm. don't run into whatever. I, uh, I kept expecting more uh home automation by this point uh, do you i mean i don't i decided i don't like this stuff very much do, do, do you like does that interest you would you like smart technology to with your lighting and for example there are things that i see advantages to for instance a motion sensor yeah that's automation in a sense uh do i want to control things with my smartphone? No, because I don't trust that somebody else won't be able to. Somebody who's just too clever with computers and has too much time on hands or is too greedy. So it's been uh it's been a joy talking to you, David. And to you, Patrick. Uh is there anything you want to tell or ask our listeners before we go? Yeah. The, the the one thing I'd say is if you don't like the rules, if you actually – you need to study the rules. Uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, named, a dead man named Terry Pratchett, uh, said in one of his books, that's the reason you learn the rules. So you think before you break them. <laughs> And if you don't like the rules, you have power to change them. The electrical code has a change in the requirement for receptacles in hotels because a lady whose husband would travel around to give seminars and she would accompany him. She didn't like where the receptacles were located because they had to be yay far apart. And here's the fixed bed. Why don't we have a receptacle to the side of it? She sent a proposal. It got passed. A part of the past changes. And I've sent in proposals for years. And I got changes in the last edition of the code, this edition of the code. I volunteer on you all panels. So if I think this product, this, this product should, should protect us from this. this. This is a lousy design. I have a voice. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm on the, the standards technical panel for ground forward interrupters. And we had a question put to the panel, uh, a formal interpretation, essentially. Hey, if a breaker is GFCI, uh, can it stop functioning when the GFCI reaches end of life? It's no longer going to work. And it was up to us. We said, no, it has to flip off or give us a light and stop working. It's not good enough. We had to decide. And I felt good that I could be part of saying, no, make it safer because people won't notice otherwise. And this is for their safety. So I'd say, yeah, get involved if you don't like it. But first of all, learn, know what you're doing. Realize that Romex is for dry locations and indoor locations. And so under the eaves is not a dry location, even though you think it is. If you look in the electrical code, it defines it as a damp location. 
and it's not ultraviolet resistant. You have to know that. And if you put it in pipe, that's still a wet location because the inside of pipe outdoors underground is considered. You don't know this unless you study it. How could you? It's not innately, you know, this baby. Yeah, it, as soon as they learn to speak, you say, hey, is the inside of a pipe a dry look? <laughs> when you learn, you study it. You can be a great carpenter and you're not going to know this. So you need to learn it or get somebody who knows it because you don't know what you don't know. And that's when we really get in trouble, right? When I wrote about the building code and about electricians running cable, and it's not just an inch and a quarter from the edge of the stud or the joist, but it's away from the middle because the, the middle is where you're taking all the weight. My reader said, oh, my God, can you tell me something more about the IRC? I need to know this stuff. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I, I have to have you back on if you're if you're willing. Next book. I mean, I didn't even talk about 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 this one because this is this you have to be an expert. This is by me and my mentor Creighton Schwan. Behind and it's the called code. Behind the Code: NEC's History. Boy, that is for a nerdy electrician, if I can offer that. Or or <laughs> yeah, or, or a teacher. But my next book, uh, I'll 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 reach out to you when the next book comes because that's going to be even more for for homeowners, handymen, handy women, you know, people in different trades. So we'll talk again if you're up for it. I totally am up for it. It's been a pleasure. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Jeff. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to David Spear for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening and helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening. 